Bonjour à tous. Uh, welcome again. Good afternoon to everyone. Very happy to see you again for this session on inflation. I'm Thierry Fabre from Challenge, and I will present to you the members of this roundtable as they come up. Just a few minutes to give you the uh, context of this uh, topic. I'm very happy to moderate this topic because everyone is talking about these inflation risks. It's really extraordinary to see how inflation has come back in our lives, in our news, in people's life, in economists' work, whilst we had forgotten about it since the 80s. And we are completely uh, uh, thrown back by this return of inflation. I would like to uh, remind you a few figures. In France, where it, is the, it was uh, one of the main, with purchasing power, the main uh, topic, we have a rate of 4.5% in one year. But when we look at our 11% uh, for uh, Netherlands, Germans, 8%. For Baltic countries, Estonia, 19% in one year. If we look at figures for Union, European Union, certain for food industry, it's 9% average. Energy, 38%. So can you imagine the damage in certain countries? We're going to talk about it with some of our uh, guests. But in France, even if the problem is, uh, of course, very important for households and companies, we have the feeling that we are a little bit preserved from this uh, uh, topic. So we're going to launch this roundtable, trying to find answers to these uh, big questions uh, of the return of inflation. Where does it come from? Uh, this uh, phenomenon that we had forgotten. What is the scope of uh, this phenomenon uh, according to uh, people's uh, uh, social, uh, socioeconomic uh, level for households, for companies? Third question, the essential is uh, the length of uh, this uh, uh, of this uh, inflation, uh, European Central Bank announces that 2023 things will be stabilized. Can we believe it? And how are we going to answer uh, to this uh, issue? Uh, do we have emergency measures that we have to uh, implement? Uh, the roles of uh, companies, do they need to increase salaries? Some, are, some of them are doing it, others don't, and also monetary authorities, they have their role to play because the monetary policy is very important and the European Central Bank has a very important role to play. Philippe Aguillon, who is uh, joining us in Visio, uh, you are known, you are one of the main eco French economists, specialist of growth with the Schupeterian uh, theory of uh, growth that, that was really uh, uh, saluted by your peers academically. And I would like you to, to tell us the context and tell us about the impact of this return of inflation on growth, because uh, we can see that the last forecast of European C uh, Commission uh, show that there is a strong impact on uh, economic activity. Philip, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Thierry. Thanks for inviting me to this roundtable on inflation. Inflation, if it, uh, I have an echo of my own voice, says the speaker. It's not very nice. Inflation will lead to uh, higher interest rates. If you have a higher interest rate, uh, they have a negative effect on growth. So it is, uh, it has its this impact. It's very important to limit inflation. Uh, we are very lucky in France because we have limited uh, the uh, inflation to 4.5 percent, and we could do it because our dependency to energies, fossil energies, is lower thanks to nuclear energy. So nuclear energy helped us a lot because we're less dependent than Germans or others uh, to fossil uh, energies. And uh, thanks to nuclear energy, we could limit the impact of inflation. For the two thirds, inflation is explained by energy and food. Energy, we could limit it, as I said, because we have this nuclear energy. And also because we have uh, put a uh, like a protection on uh, tarification of energy, and at the moment, 
we were not into the uh, sp spiral. When we came out of COVID, everyone started uh, creating uh, many things and lots of demand, and the offer wasn't following. And when the offer doesn't follow demand, the uh, prices are increasing. And then the uh, Ukrainian crisis that really increased uh, the prices of energy. So all those shocks have uh, impacts on food and on energy. And in France, uh, we have avoided this uh, bad spiral, but we need to uh, really uh, make it happen. And I think the government is doing a great job here because it is postponing the Pistola spiral thanks to this uh, protection of uh, tarification. Uh, protecting uh, the uh, smaller revenues with uh, indexation of uh, uh, minimum uh, earnings uh, on price and uh, also giving uh, bonuses to salaried people, giving bonuses so that they can go through 2022 and looking at uh, uh, negotiation uh, because then there are going to be a big dem demand for increasing salaries. The idea is to postpone this to put it as uh, for it to happen as late as possible so that we can really go through 2022 and see how things are in 2023. And if we can avoid this uh, vicious spiral, uh, then we would have achieved something really good because in the States, I think the spiral is already there and I think we're going to try to avoid it. On a long-term basis, we need to relaunch the offer. So this inflation shouldn't really uh, make us renounce to investments that should push the offer uh, forward. And you know that uh, the government has uh, programs for uh, energy energetic transition and re-industrialization. And we shouldn't renounce to this uh, energy transition and uh, through innovation and uh, for the, uh, the um, uh, and because it would be a big mistake because we want the offer to increase. And uh, the re-industrialization through innovation is also a big tool to do so. Thank you, Philippe. From what you said, it is a phenomenon that is uh, really given in the context nowadays, and we can try to stop it now if we follow your concepts. Now, Yves Perrier, you are uh, head of uh, the Amundi uh, uh, Administration Council, and. Uh, the inflation, you can see it uh, in the uh, uh, inflation of uh, price of assets. And you gave an interview to challenge Mr. Perrier where you said we need to increase uh, uh, increase our uh, salaries. You can't just uh, have 5% increase of prices and salaries are not falling. When you we listen to Philippe Aguillon, who uh, really uh, is uh, warning us against the pre-seller spiral. What, what do you think? Mr. Perry, obviously you... And now I can hear you. <laughs> but I couldn't hear the question. Can you hear me now? Yes, simply. Philippe Aguillon just explained to us that we should limit uh, this uh, uh, through the uh, view of this inflation, the spiral uh, price against salary. So we need to really increase salaries. You can't accept that uh, salaried people should really have such a loss in their purchasing power. So how do you feel about this when you hear this uh, ratio uh, price salary? I understand about the causes of inflation. There is also another cause. It is structural, and I think it is durable, because uh, today's causes are the price of energy, price of uh, the uh, imbalance between the offer and the demand after the COVID crisis. But also, we have two other factors we have to take into account. The first one is the end of the globalization as we have known it since uh, but uh, I mean for the past 40 years where we can produce anywhere in the world and there is no uh, strategic or uh, consideration I think this is uh, the end of this time 
globalization is going to carry on, but uh, on a more regional basis, you will, we will need to produce a lot more regionally, locally, which is a good piece of news, but it will cost a lot more. Second factor, which I think is very important, it's ahead of us, is the cost of uh, the energy transition. This energy transition will uh, need uh, very high investments. 10,000 billion euros uh, by 2030. And the, the way it is going to be allocated, the cost is going to be allocated uh, for the bill between the consumer, the taxpayer, and uh, the capital yield is uh, not defined. So at the time in Europe, uh, contrary to the States, we're not in a uh, salary uh, price dynamic for the inflation. We need to postpone it, I agree, but at the same time we need to have a different um, way of uh, doing it. Uh, I'm talking about real revenues for really lower incomes because inflation doesn't really affect people in the same way whether you're consuming the whole of your uh, earnings and if you can save uh, some, uh, you don't have the same feeling about the inflation. So we need to have uh, salary policies and uh, earning policies that are differentiated uh, according to uh, social, uh, socio-economic categories. I think that for the past 40 years, we have uh, 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 lived in a context that was really characterized by the uh, very low interest rates, and they kept on uh, uh, becoming very, very low up to a negative uh, rate. Uh, with uh, the importation of uh, disinflation through emerging countries, we're going, going out of this cycle. We're not going to carry the inflation of emerging countries, and uh, it's going to be endogenous in the Western countries, and uh, interest rates are going to go high, are going to go up. It will depend on the rhythm and the scope of uh, this um, increase. We might have less inflation for assets than we had in the recent uh, years. When you measure inflation, you need to make a difference between goods and assets. I think it's very different. Thank you very much. Uh, Yves Perrier will come back to these uh, questions. Samuel uh, Sam Golshani, your uh, partners uh, in the White and Case uh, uh, in the uh, Cabinet, and you have uh, mergers and acquisitions, have a great experience in this topic. And uh, in the interview you gave to Challenge, you criticize the uh, policy of central banks. If we look at the uh, explanations, do you think that uh, uh, the monetary policy is wrong. We have injected uh, hundreds of uh, thousands of uh, billions of uh, cash to counteract its uh, inflation. As a lawyer, I'm not going to really uh, say this, but we have experts around this virtual table. We haven't spoken about this. But this uh, monetary policy that was may be very smart during the financial crisis between the quantitative easing. Maybe it helped creating a good ground for uh, the inflation. Now, uh, the title of uh, this roundtable is uh, Inflation uh, Reality. Uh, it's the return of inflation. We should really uh, call it that way, call a spade a spade, because it is we have uh, uh, inflation now. The real question is, isn't it the time to, and the central banks are doing it like in the States, isn't it the time to uh, rest, uh, restrain the access to these monetary funds and uh, it will should lead to consequences like uh, interest rates are going to increase and more pressure on uh, companies that uh, have debts and uh, also uh, that could lead to different adjustments and uh, financial restructuring in the years to come. And maybe I'll, uh, inflation uh, has many impacts. We spoke about uh, the uh, uh, cost of money uh, that increases, but also 
uh, the, the need today to have a strategy reflection on sovereignty and the sovereignty, whether it is it abides by the industry, energy, through the reindustrialization, are elements that will allow to mitigate the impact of uh, inflation. We spoke about the uh, increase of the real revenues of uh, salaried people. And uh, aren't we at a point where we need to share more and better share with all the uh, with all the stakeholders around the company so that we there is no point today is in thinking uh, and really we should really help them not uh, to have access to company capitals and to take their part in the creating uh, wealth and uh, really taking part of it so that it could mitigate the effect of inflation thank you very much we have many, uh, many topics. Philippe Aguillon, if we come back to what you said, this uh, spiral uh, price salary, we understand the macroeconomic uh, subject, but do we need to accept a loss of uh, purchase power? Um, does it have a uh, direct impact on households and companies? Yes, I agree with what uh, the other guests have said. We need to protect the most vulnerable people, so index uh, pensions, uh, b benefits, uh, give bonuses to salaried people who are, have very low incomes. Uh, of course, we need to protect these people. For this category, it's really whatever it costs, as uh, President Macron said. And the idea is to have an indexation up to when we uh, until the uh, salary negotiation will have to uh, to happen but then we hope we hope that the offer will uh, have uh, uh, started again it's like a race you have the inflation starting and you you don't want it to gener degenerate too quickly in a spiral so the the offer uh, starts again so that when the offer increases, we can counter uh, attack. And this is this rate, uh, this race we are uh, doing now. So thanks to these bonuses, indexations, and uh, different protection of uh, tarifications with uh, a, uh, the re-industrialization and a really um, uh, tr energy transition, thanks to the offer, we can relaunching this offer is it's a real race and we need to um, have a, uh, to get into debt at a short term basis so that our bill or quotation isn't too bad on markets the uh, pension reform is really paramount and france needs to do its pension reform it's really important uh, if we don't have this pension reform in France, we can't afford to uh, get into debt as we're going to do it. So we need to compensate the most uh, vulnerable and uh, have an indexation on energy transition and re-industrialization. To do so, we need to carry on with reforms. And the most important one is the uh, pension reforms. If Perrier, on this subject of mitigation of uh, inflation impact that doesn't cost a lot of money. Uh, there's all these costs, all these expenses for uh, energy transition. And you are trying you, uh, to think about how we can share this cost. You uh, uh, really uh, uh, call for uh, reducing uh, the participation, capital participation. Can you please help us? And how are we going to go about it? Uh, how can uh, uh, asset holders, how can they uh, ask for wonderful yields of 15%, for example? Uh, shareholders, we're talking. Uh, those are yields. Of uh, return on investment of 15%, that was set in the middle of the 90s. At that time, I think the uh, rate without any 7% was uh, with no risk. So it was twice the uh, no risk rate. We maintained it was the uh, uh, risk no risk rate uh, were nearly zero. 
we could maintain this 15% because there's a strong flow of cash that uh, allow, uh, thanks to this monetary policy uh, that was very accommodating, that is led since the uh, 2007 financial crisis. 2007 crisis came from excess of debt. We, we really um, got into more debts and COVID, we treated it with uh, even more debts. So our level of uh, debt, whether it's public or private at a world level, is uh, very high and it, it has never been so high. So we have a debt level that is extremely high and it has been inflated by all the leverage effects. And on top of that, we need to uh, finance the energy transition. I define it as a industrial revolution. We speak about energy offer and we're right in doing so. We need to transform production modes we want we still will do uh, cement or steel but differently and for to do the electrical car and we're changing things and we're changing value chains but it's not going to create a real use of values because we will still have cars we will uh, heat ourselves differently but uh, it'll be different from the other uh, industrial revolutions but the idea that uh, this uh, financial uh, uh, cost is paid by taxpayers or by consumers is not possible. It has to be uh, fairly uh, allocated uh, so that the consumer uh, uh, needs to adapt the uses uh, to have a better efficiency from uh, energy. Also taxpayers, they need to do it because it is a work of uh, deep transformation so collective mobilization is needed, but also we need to have uh, realist uh, levels of uh, yielding of capital. Of course, we have uh, general and global phenomena, but this um, uh, inflation uh, is not going to translate itself in the same uh, way. The companies were really, uh, are really uh, very happy and uh, they are gaining. Uh, you have all the uh, oil industry. Uh, maritime transportation, uh, steel industry, where results are very good, very positive. So they are really the winners of this uh, situation. Other industries are the losers. So we will need to better organize the way in which we uh, match the action of uh, the state through public policies and taxing systems of company and to um, balance it with the financial system. And I think that a plan planification uh, that's not a good, uh, for 40 years we say that is not a good idea, but planning like Jean Monnet did in the 50s, planning is really necessary today. Mr. Golshani, on this idea of mitigation of the impact of uh, inflation for salaried people, there are ideas like uh, uh, the, the dividend of, uh, for salary for, uh, that would be compulsory to give them back to the employees. It is an idea that you have criticized. What is your approach to compensate the uh, bad uh, effects of inflation for salaried people? How can we do that on a big scale? When we speak about dividend, if we speak, uh, you have shareholders behind. You can have a, uh, you can't not do it without salaried people being shareholders. How can uh, employees become shareholders if you have a shareholding by companies? Uh, uh, Besides a big uh, company that are quoted on the stock exchange, uh, you need to limit uh, taxation uh, of this uh, instrument into the hands of salaried people with this idea of uh, the state that wants to push uh, forward for salaried people to become sh uh, shareholders. But then at the same time, we try to avoid tax uh, payment, uh, tax service. So. 
I'm not happy with the uh, state intervening too much in the economy, but here I understand this notion and this need to plan on a long-term basis that is necessary uh, through the uh, energy, energetic and technological revolution we are uh, going through. So state has to really uh, ease on the taxation and so that they have access to capital. And then uh, shareholders of a given company, they vote a uh, qualified majority to open the capital uh, through with uh, shares, free shares. We shouldn't have any uh, uh, stopping to this uh, through tax, through taxation or whatever. Shareholders should decide to give uh, free shares to salaried people so that they can have dividends. But I am against this um, compulsory dividends for salaried people or other shareholders is because today when you think about social interest, this, uh, the interest of the company, the uh, money can be better used by the company if you reinvest uh, to uh, prepare yourself to energy transition and to this uh, notion of uh, economic and industrial sovereignty rather than uh, distribute it back to these shareholders in an endless race uh, for uh, the yielding and uh, return on uh, capital and investment because there's a phenomenon and then you lose the capacity of investment of companies because they're only motivated by policy of dividend uh, retribution. So the idea was to obli uh, oblige companies to increase uh, salaries if they uh, gave uh, dividends. Yes, but then there is a tax uh, uh, problem. Uh, if you want salaried people to create value for the company, they need to be shareholders. There is no other way. You can have a caste society where where you have uh, two worlds that live together and a legislator has to force one to allow the other to uh, get the benefit of the fruits of uh, their work. Cap human capital is just as important as financial capital and they can live together in the social capital of the company. Thank you very much. Philippe Pagnon, I would like you to react on what Yves Perrier said on globalization. Uh, recent globalization, he says that there is a regionalization now so that uh, there, there could be an increase of prices if you produce more locally. Uh, salaries are higher because uh, it's much salaries are much higher than in uh, Southeast Asia or in uh, North Africa. So is it going to uh, create a uh, durable inflation. It depends whether you can innovate. If you innovate, you can uh, lower prices and also automatization. We, we're always afraid of autom automated stuff, but there are many things uh, that create uh, uh, employment because they are productive and they increase the uh, world share market, uh, market share, sorry. So, education, automation, and innovation together will allow us to uh, reconquest uh, added, uh, value, uh, chain value on the world scale without uh, increasing uh, prices because uh, the adjusted prices, uh, they can uh, really uh, decrease thanks to innovation and automation of uh, tasks with a qualified manpower so that we can follow this revolution. So I think we have the keys. We're not, uh, there, it's not a condemnation. Uh, it, the idea is not to produce in countries where the uh, uh, man hour is f very cheap. We can automate and uh, use robots educating our workforce at the same time because companies who, are, who have gone through automation are creating uh, employment because the effect of uh, productivity are really uh, higher uh, and uh, they win. If Perry, I come back to you on challenge, you spoke about uh, the de-dramatization of this topic, saying that inflation can also have good effects for debt, for example, because it will um, it will uh, uh, lower our uh, burden. And if we look at this realization, we create more 
uh, employment because 100,000 industrial jobs were lost because of the globalization effects. Can you detail this positive uh, impact of inflation? I will say what I have said already. I said that uh, more inflation can uh, really uh, increase the rate. The main question is we we have more growth. That's the main issue. And to have more growth, we will need many things. First of all, a offer policy of investment because we're going to, uh, we're not going to re-industrialize for one day to the next. We'll need uh, time to do that. We need to have uh, the right policy for investment, massive investment, not just in capital, uh, but also in human capital to feed this new demand of uh, innovation. But we must be very uh, careful with the demand. If we just organize massive, massively the uh, lowering of uh, uh, purchasing power on real-term basis, uh, locking salaries according to inflation, we could find ourselves in a context where we have inflation and no growth. And that could be um, uh, really uh, additionally uh, increased by the uh, monetary policy, what it could do vis-a-vis uh, -vis inflation, whatever interest rates, it will not cost anything, it will not change anything to the cost of uh, energy transition. If a raw material, for whatever reason, is very expensive, interest rates uh, can be high, it will not change anything. And I think that here we have a strong problem of uh, uh, monetary policy, the monetary policy that is carried out since Mario Draghi, since 2007, consisted of uh, giving flows of cash without thinking of uh, how it was going to be used, this cash, whilst really this cash have, uh, has contributed to increasing of valorization, creating a bubble sometimes, but then not really to investment. And I think we should have a monetary policy for energetic transition that uh, should have a special bucket for transition, uh, for transition, but to come back to normal uh, monetary policy. The paradox is, is that sometimes it brings infine, uh, it takes us to classical investments at the detriment of uh, business uh, to, uh, sorry, to uh, uh, investments that are necessary for the energy uh, transition and re-industrialization on a sovereignty basis. And this is where the planification concept is really necessary. We need to plan uh, measures because we were considering that we're living in a no constraint global world, but the constraints have become real uh, with a sovereign tree, a sovereign uh, competitivity constraints, uh, social impact, re-industrialization, and that needs uh, really to be aligned. All the stakeholders need to be aligned and online, and it's co-building together. It's not bureaucracy where you explain uh, how you need to work in each factory. So, Philippe, I'd like to come back to you uh, regarding what Mr. Perrier said about the central banks. It seems to be very pivotal. There's been an inter interview in Challenge, a newspaper. An economist said that are warned against the overreaction of the central banks during the previous inflation peaks, leading us to, a, a, to a, a, an inflation. What should they do? Should they break? Should put the brakes uh, to, to 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 avoid inflation, or should they be remaining with the same type of policy to avoid what was done in the past with very high rate hikes? <coughs> well, apparently we've lost uh, Philippe. Well, can you hear me? Well, yes, we can hear you. Yeah, okay, fine. Well, right. Well, I understand that well. I think that 
we need to have a moderate reaction of the bank, of the central banks. So we have to do everything we can to limit the inflationary spiral. We have to delay uh, uh, and the magnitude of inflation. So the measures taken by the French government uh, are okay, but they're not going to determine the policy of the ECB. However, we want to avoid to have an overreaction of the central banks, and it's very important that uh, they shouldn't react too much because there's a very temporary uh, m m side uh, to the war in um, in Ukraine and the the, the 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 mismatch between supply and demand. There's always uh, this to take into account, so it shouldn't be uh, taken too much into account. Or th th sh we shouldn't overreact. It's always the problem that we are always coming back to Jackson rules uh, uh, or Draghi um, when he was uh, heading the ECB. This is what we can do. Uh, what we can't do. Uh, what can the states do? Well, they can have uh, structural policies in order to make the right investments and doing what they can to avoid inflationary spiral. This is what the government can do. But on the other hand, the central banks uh, cannot uh, not so, uh, react to inflation, but it should do it with moderation. And all the much so, uh, uh, all the more so, as inflation is overestimated by 0.7 percent point uh, it's not very much but still it is overestimated so we usually we do not measure inflation well we overestimate it and underestimate the growth the real growth of productivity so you have to be very careful here and you should react they should react moderately because this is a very transient situation and the war in ukraine is not going to last for a very long time and the supply should uh, bring, be matched with demand. And I think it depends on us as well, on the policies that we are making. So we have to adjust it. The banks should increase their, inf their interest rates by coordinating themselves, then we can uh, move through that difficult period. Mr. Giussani, do you have an advice? You are not an economist, but what should the central banks do? You have talked about the, or you denounced, the in, uh, massive injection of liquidity, what, what should they do? I have no advice uh, to give, but however, I am witness, witnessing daily uh, the, this financial world through our in interventions with our customers. And uh, it is true that uh, this injection, massive injection of liquidity since from 2007 onwards, uh, has uh, brought about a, tr a true credit, uh, <coughs> uh, uh, has enabled us to, to dampen uh, the uh, credit uh, crisis and then brought back uh, trust in the banks and avoid a major uh, crisis, uh, financial crisis. But ever since then, the central banks haven't done anything and the liquidities have been injected continuously in the system. And maybe we should come back to a vision which would be more orthodox of the interest rates by the uh, in, uh, issued by the uh, interest rates. They have saved us with the COVID uh, uh, without the uh, massive intervention of the central banks. They, were, they already done that in 2007. Nothing more took place. We have created uh, the constraints of the COVID uh, by taking extreme measures. And then after that, uh, we can say that what France did was a very good thing. Uh, but th there's a debt uh, cost uh, to take into account and to reimburse as well by increasing the interest rates. Uh, we are going to better measure risks and enable the market to adjust, to adjust itself. And there will be losers and winners. And of course, there will be financial restructuring as a result. And if you inject massively all these liquidities, it won't be possible to manage uh, this mass of debt which is accumulating because we have never had such a high level of uh, uh, indebtedness with the uh, individuals and the companies as well. Uh, there's no question on my tablet, so please do not hesitate if you want to ask any other question through via the site. If you want to have our uh, guests uh, respond, 
Well, I'd like you to witness, uh, not on the Central Bank, but uh, what about your major corporate uh, clients? We've had a challenge uh, um, a survey on the wage uh, bargaining, and uh, well, this has started with the major companies. It's uh, something which hadn't been, uh, happened before. This this is something new, and the prices are accelerating so much so that uh, there are compensations. What about the examples that you see around you? What is the climate? What is the atmosphere? What about the leaders? Are they determined to increase greatly because they are aware there's a major problem? Or would it create the spiral that Mr. Anu was referring to? Yes, I think there is a transformation in the in the labor rights and law with the COVID pandemic as well. And with the distance working, the mode of operations have been uh, changing. And particularly in France, there's been a generation which is called the startup or tech or whatever, showing that there's another way of working. And we can see that all this is uh, fundamentally changing the relationship between the corporates and the um, individuals or the employees. And some leaders have found that, uh, or some managers found that the human capital shouldn't be left aside to share wealth in within a capitalistic society. That's healthy, and this is why there's this reopening of bargaining, because you cannot leave the employees as the only one not profiting from this creation, because uh, I would like to come back to what has been said, this massive injection of liquidity in the system without any destination, which has been uh, going into the price of the uh, and yield of uh, shares. But part of this money should also be directed towards the individuals. And those who chose to be employees, they shouldn't, uh, they, why shouldn't they benefit from the creation of values? And I think, and we can see with our customers as well, that there's a true reflection on how we can associate the employees with the value creation. It goes through the uh, increase in wages, but not only. Well, I'd like to come to another uh, topic, uh, the economist, and I'd like to ask a question about the economist and inflation. Have they forgotten the problem? Because I can remember there was an alert by Olivier Blanchard uh, a year and a half ago, and he was very alone saying that there should be a spiral and it reminding us of the 70s, much before the inflationist uh, shock that we know now. What about the economists? Did they underestimate this phen phenomenon or not? Well, I think that, uh, again, I think that the inflation that we have today is due to act factors that were not uh, envisageable, uh, like COVID. Uh, uh, <clears throat> pandemic could not be planned, um, and uh, and the war in Re Ukraine could not be anticipated either. And so this inflation is due to these phenomena, and this is uh, something we couldn't plan. We couldn't expect that, and the pandemic uh, arrived as well. And uh, we couldn't. Uh, we, we did what we had to do, and uh, we were right to have a monetary policy that was. Uh, uh, accommodating and uh, meaning that uh, if uh, the central banks can no longer do more quantitative easing we have to co we we have to consider maastricht uh, uh, principles and uh, we had a policy where all expenditures were on the same level, where it shouldn't exceed 3% of the GDP. But I think this inter interpretation of Maastricht is, uh, is over. We have to distinguish between the functioning operating uh, expenses due to the deficits that are structural with the retirement schemes and also the investment uh, expenditures in, in, in the environment. And this is what Marion Draghi has said. What did he do in Italy? He promised to uh, have a reform in the state, but as a result, he had the green lights of the of the European institutions to invest in research, in education, and so on and so forth. And we should be doing the same thing. And I think that the luck that we have is that Germany, as well, is aware that, uh, that it should accelerate its uh, energy transition and to be freed from the uh, Russian ga gas and it should invest in defense. It has been become aware that its infrastructure are old and they should be modernized. And the major chance that we have that we can commit ourselves in the reinterpretation of Maastricht, because even the, uh, the Germans have to invest. 
and and we have to give some uh, um, tokens that we are serious and we have to do this uh, reform of the re uh, retirement schemes and uh, we shouldn't be catastrophic at saying that everything is uh, is over no we have to the budget policy means that we have to rethink about the drug doctrine and uh, and doing some uh, retirement uh, reforms and state reforms and reindustrialize the country and i think we have to take this heading and keep this heading and not deviate from it well if perrier another topic that uh, we didn't refer to which is a major concern which is the household or rather the real estate inflation which existed before the shock that we know today and isn't that the major inequality in in because before this inflationary shock french people had the feeling that the purchasing power was lower and uh, and, and, and as a result, with this inflation shock, it will be even worse. What would you recommend in order to get rid of this inflation and uh, in terms of the price of uh, lodgings, for example? Well, have you heard me? No. Uh, no. Uh. So the, the, the question was, for, well, can I ask the question? Do you want me to ask the question again? Well, well, about uh, real estate, inflation. We are talking about food, energy. What about real estate? For many years, we've had a, a problem with the real estate, uh, the cost of real estate, the price of. Well, shall I respond? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, very, very well. So, what has taken place in terms of the price for uh, the uh, real estate uh, buildings? They have increased uh, greatly all over the last 25 to 30 years, and largely due to this uh, monetary policy, which has enabled uh, interest rates that were very low. What happened between 2000 and, and 2020? We moved from an interest rate that was at uh, four to five percent, and loans at 15 uh, to interest rates that are now at one or one and point and a half and duration of 25 years uh, uh, versus 15 years before. So for those who are purchasing, this is the amount of the reimbursement, which is take, which is important. So um, this, uh, this uh, lower interest rates led to the increase of the value of the assets. And also the other factor is that we haven't built a sufficient amount of buildings or dwellings and uh, and in France with the inflation when somebody's buying a, a house or uh, over 25 years with a, a loan we consider that he should have paid 30 percent higher than a few years before we consider we do not consider this as an inflation measure however for the person who's purchasing this house or this lodging it, it, it once he, he has paid and reimbursed his loan uh, there's a major discrepancy here and so today what should be done we should have a um, policy with where we are building houses uh, and dwellings uh, and buildings which would be much more offensive than what we have and there are a number of uh, breaks unfortunately with the uh, uh, the price of the land and so this is the only way of uh, uh, making this cost uh, more affordable and this will be all the more important as the uh, rates will be hiked and for the uh, those who are accessing uh, property for the first time, it will be more difficult for them uh, to acquire a building. Well, thank you. I, th I think we come to the end of this uh, particular session. And uh, Philippe Payon, uh, to conclude, what shall we retain uh, from? Uh, what about what you're saying? Are we are optimistic. We feel that this is a heading that has to be crossed and uh, it will not really encroach on our growth. Are you in agreement with this? Well, as I'm saying that we have to do as much as we can. We cannot say that uh, we're living in the best of the worlds, but uh, I have a Gramsci-based uh, 
uh, optimism. We have we have some leverages, and Europe uh, can uh, mutualize the debt, and it has the possibility to get loans. So there are major investments to be made in education, in uh, energy transition, and reindustrialization. As I've told you. Germany should, uh, is going to do the same. We, we cannot uh, delay all these investments, so inflation is uh, something to go over. But then these investments will enable us to do that. There's a number of things that we can do in the mid and long, uh, long term with more investments and more uh, indebtedness. But while we are making these investments, we'll have some structural reforms giving us the credibility needed, because otherwise we won't be able to get money easily on the mar debt market. Market. So you should give some tokens by doing this reform, pension reforms and the reform of the state, giving us the credibility uh, so that on the one hand you can help those who are um, the, the poorest uh, to uh, match this uh, inflation crisis and the, the response through the supply, which is the best uh, way, the best solution. This, this is what we should do. This give us a, a general idea. So, do you, uh, do you uh, f share this? Well, I do share this optimism because I believe that uh, inflation and the Ukrainian conflict, COVID pandemic and the end of a certain uh, fluidity of transport and the inter connectivity of all the countries uh, will enable each and every country to rethink uh, uh, the strategically uh, in terms of sovereignty and I think this question of sovereignty national sovereignty without any ideology here it becomes a very important element and this is through this element that each and every country would be able to find its own way and Europe as a political entity should also find its own way and it seems essential indispensable to think about reindustrializing the country and thinking about the military uh, and energy and defense uh, sovereignty and energy transition per country and it goes through a policy a support policy and it's only through that that will be better prepared uh, for, to the other shocks because the Ukrainian conflict conflict will uh, end and there will be another pandemic coming <clears throat> and so this uh, bubble of about 30 years or 40 years following the Second World War where the Western world thought it was uh, sheltered from history I think this bubble is over and now we Strangely or paradoxically, I think it's a matter of optimism for us because we have become realistic as a result. Mr. Perrier, this would be the last word. And I'd like to ask you the, la the same. Uh, uh, do you share the same optimism as the other members of that roundtable discussion? Or just like Philippe Ayon, I, I, I'm very much optimistic. Uh, Gramshan, this is the optimism of the will. Now, uh, there are two things to consider here we underestimate the magnitude of the of this industrial revolution which is taking place now this uh, industrial revolution i think france has got many assets uh, in this game thanks to its energy system even if we have uh, with the nuclear plants we have um, a certain number of uh, defects and uh, of, of flaws that can certainly be corrected now the second point is that, uh, and I support what uh, my colleague said, you can no longer separate uh, economy, political vision, and a strategy per country for all the European countries. We should all have a strategy with our strengths and weaknesses. And the last item concerning the budget policy, uh, and I believe that we are living a, a time, at a time when we must be uh, saving in terms of the uh, state expenditures and red tape uh, costs. Uh, this is useless, uh, but we should be able to, to invest uh, uh, to be one of the winning countries following this energy transition because any transformation w will lead to winners and uh, losers. Thank you to you all for this very interesting uh, talk and we've been looking at very uh, various topics and I'd like to give the floor to Vincent who's got a very important announcement to make. Well, yes, because uh, we haven't uh, ended this uh, day, we still have a beautiful gift uh, to offer uh, to you with TSE, which is the 
some form of a lesson, inaugural lesson, with the Nobel Prize of 2019, Michael Kramer, who for the first time in Europe has drawn or has has drawn his own vision and the lesson of the pandemic and uh, it will not be exactly at the seven at five thirty when we have the live with Chicago. But then I know this is the end of the day, but still this is something which is uh, worth uh, listening to and this is at the very heart of the common good uh, chapter that we are tackling at the moment. So you should listen to him and then we'll we'll uh, talk uh, about it late afterwards.